Good morning, Plum Creek. How you doing today? Come on, let's stand up. We're going to worship. We're going to sing to our Savior. Let's sing this out together through every battle. Through every battle. Through every heartbreak. Through every circumstance. I believe that you are my fortress. Oh, you are my portion. You are my hiding.
Give somebody a high five or a handshake today and grab a seat. Hey church, we have some exciting updates on our Seeds campaign. We're thrilled to announce that we'll be breaking ground this next month. On the west side of our current building, we're adding over 11,000 square feet of dedicated children's and multi-purpose space. This expansion will allow our first through fifth graders to come back over from the school and to bring everyone under one roof again. In addition, part of the design includes a sensory room for children with special needs, new family check-in area, a revamped main atrium space, and so much more. Thank you for your commitment to seeing the lives of children and families changed here in our community. And thank you for your patience and your financial partnership as we've readied this project for this moment. To celebrate, we're going to have a groundbreaking ceremony and we want to invite everyone to join. Bring the whole family to celebrate here on Sunday, July 28th at 5 p.m. There'll be free food, fun, games, as well as an intentional time to pray over the project ahead of us. Again, we're so excited about what God has done, continues to do in and through this church. Thanks for being a church that cares deeply about reaching the future generations for Christ. We look forward to seeing you on the 28th. Good morning. Welcome to Plum Creek Church. My name's Olivia. I'm one of the pastors here. Thank you for joining us this morning. And shout out to those of you who are watching online. We're glad you're with us too. Well, to follow up on that video, if you don't know, our Seeds campaign has been two years in the making to live out this vision and this plan to expand our children's wing. So we are so excited to finally be breaking ground. And again, we want you there to celebrate on July 28th at 5 p.m we want this to be the, a time to come together as a church and with our families to just give God all the thanks for his faithfulness and provision. So we'd love to have you there. Well, if you're new this morning to Plum Creek, we know there are a lot of great churches here in Castle Rock. So thanks for coming to be with us. If you are new, we want you to know one thing. We're all about seeing change lives, changing lives here at Plum Creek. And what that simply means is we believe what God has done in us is not only for us. We exist to see lives changed in this community and in turn, those lives invest in others. And we would love for you to be a part of that. If you are new, we would love if you take a quick minute and fill out one of these next step cards in the seat back pocket in front of you. This is not scary, I promise. No one's coming to your house. It is a quick phone call or email this week to answer any questions you have and let you know you, how you can get plugged in here at Plum Creek. You can take your time with these and drop them off in the buckets at the end of service. This morning, we have an opportunity to give back to God. And giving is something we do every single week here at Plum Creek, as we believe we should trust God in all areas of our life, especially with our finances. So if you're wondering how to get involved with giving here at Plum Creek, there's an envelope also in that seat back pocket in front of you with instructions on how to give even via text or through our Plum Creek app. If you don't know, we've moved to a new platform, which is easier and more secure. Uh, our ushers will be at the doors at the end of service to receive that giving but we just want to say thank you so much for being an incredible church with generous hearts and generous habits we are so grateful well I'm really excited you're here this morning it's gonna be a good day why don't you go ahead and stand back up and we'll continue into worship Let the key 
never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Oh, you're faithful, Lord. next song is a new one that we taught you last week called Here and Now. And it's just a song that declares, God, we're going to worship you in every moment, in every situation. So church, come on today. Let's worship him with all of our hearts. Let's sing it. I've heard your voice calling out my name. I felt your touch and I will never be the same. Out of
Come on, I think we can sing it louder than that. Come on. Our God is no greater power today we declare that you are our healer that you're our provider that you're our source that you're our strength God that you're our peace that surpasses all understanding in a world that sometimes comes crashing in God you're our peace in the middle of the storm Lord, it's in this place we just come to worship you, to set our eyes on you. Here in this moment, here in this place, God, I pray that you would be magnified, that you would be glorified. And today that you, would, that you would do what only you can do here. We invite you just to, to redeem, to restore, to, train, to change lives. God, I pray that you would just meet each and every person where they're at today. Lord, we love you. We're so grateful for all that you've done for us. We worship you in this place. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Aren't you thankful for our great God today? Well, how are you guys doing today? Good, you're fired up. It's so awesome to hear you singing it out and worshiping with us. And we're, we're glad you're here this morning. And uh, thanks for coming at this time. Please be seated. Good morning, my name is Emily and I'm the children's pastor here. And I have the privilege of introducing our speaker this morning. He's been here before and if you've been around, you've heard him. Um, if you close your eyes, you can hear his brother speaking and that's your pastor, Pastor Doug. Um, but most importantly, this is my brother. So I'd like to introduce you to Andy Miller and you can thank him for coming all the way from Nashville. It is always an honor for me to be able to be here. Um, I, I just, it always feels so much like home. And I wish that you guys knew how meaningful it is to see you sitting here. When your brother and sister-in-law and then your sister who's doing children's day, and many of you maybe were a part of the, the beginning process of this, got together and said, hey, we're gonna, just gonna plant a church in Castle Rock and see what will happen. And this is a miracle, isn't it? I mean, be excited. God's using you guys in incredible ways. And it, it just is such a blessing to come back week after week. And, you know, uh, as, as time allows or whatever for me to be here, to be able to be here, we were able to participate in worship a, a few weeks ago before we left and went on a trip. And, man, I love your staff. I love my brother. I love my sister. I love Gary like a brother. Um, he was, I grew up with him. He was in my wedding. Um, you know, you guys have an incredible staff. And man, uh, this is the, what is this, the third time I've heard this worship set. They are incredible. Can we give them a hand?
I like get emotional. I like know what song's coming and I'm like still crying over there off to the side. So, hey, let's pray and let's get started. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today and Father, I thank you for the book of 1 John. Your scripture is living and alive. And we have it in our grasp, on our phones, um, all over the place, accessible to us so that we can experience transformation. And Father, today, even as I was praying this morning and just walking, Lord, I pray that there would be a fresh wind of your spirit that would fall in this room. that through your power of your spirit, that only you would do what you can do in the lives of the people that are here. God, we are people that are in a desperate place, longing for transformation within our lives, longing for a closer connection with you. And Father, today I pray that in a remarkable way, in a powerful way, that as we look at John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 21, and conclude this book, that you would do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, one of the things that I'm always so thankful for that my dad did for me was this. He made me a lifelong Chicago Cubs fan. I love the Cubs. I, I have followed them growing up, um, watched them on WGN, saw Kerry Wood strike out 20 people. It was one of the most amazing days of my life. Uh, I love them. Now, I don't think he ever knew what being a Chicago Cubs fan would do for my character. It has taught me that hope is eternal. <laughs> to never give up. Great things things happen to those that wait. <laughs> and that happened in 2016. It was an incredible year. For years and years, I'd watch the Cubs and, and, and you know, th there's the frustrations and there's the ups and the downs and all sorts of things. But 2016 was a magical year. We as a family would um, pile into our car and we would go down to 312, uh, a Chicago pizza restaurant, sports bar in downtown Nashville, where we were able to eat deep dish pizza and watch every playoff game with a group of people that were crazy about the Cubs. And it was so much fun. Like during the commercial breaks, they would, they would drop the volume on the TV and we would be singing Eddie Vedder's song, Someday We'll Go All the Way from Pearl Jam. And like, you know, it, it, I mean, every time I hear that song, like it brings tears to my eyes. You know, it's just an awesome thing. Game after game started to happen and, and we started winning and man, the bar was exploding with excitement. And then finally, the last pitch Grounder to, you know, Chris Bryant picks it up, throws it to first, and we won. What nobody thought would ever happen and that what people waited for over a hundred years to occur, occurred. I cried, Matt cried, Doug cried. You know, all of us were, were just basket cases. You know, you drop to your knees and you celebrate. My son and I were hugging and jumping up and down that it had Finally, finally happened. It was amazing. And it wasn't shortly after that moment that something started to happen that I was not too thrilled about. All of a sudden, there was more and more of these Chicago Cubs World Series champion shirts that started to appear on people. I would look at these people and I would think, you are not real fans. <laughs> you don't remember in 1984 when we blew it when we played the Padres. You're fake. You've jumped on the bandwagon. What on earth? As I would talk to them and, and look at their clean hats, that had never been thrown on the ground in utter disgust 
at each loss, there was anger inside of me. Because I thought, you guys have not journeyed with this tame year after year, but you just jumped on the bandwagon, and you're fake. You're not authentic. You're not real. Isn't it interesting in our culture, all of us now, more than ever, are pushing and desiring for something that is authentic and real? We want that. There's a, a cry for that. Hey, I don't, I don't want something that's, that's not real or authentic. I, I want to experience things that are firsthand, that you know, can capture my heart. Nobody likes a phony. We all want something that is real and authentic within our lives. I think that there's probably no greater place that we want that than within our walk with Christ. I remember when I was a, a junior in high school and I went on a missions trip. I, I would say this probably, you know, I grew up in a Christian home, but the reality was that I would say that my faith wasn't real. And I've been taught everything that I was supposed to be taught, absolutely, but I had yet to have this moment where everything in my head moved down to my heart. It wasn't real. Christ didn't consume me in every aspect of who I was. He ended up jumping on this bus with about 55 to 60 kids and a charter bus. And we rode from Chicago down to Tampico for a missions trip. That's a long drive. But we had just great moments together. We had fun together and we got there. And there was one moment within a church service where everything became real to me. Where all of a sudden my relationship with Christ became something that was so authentic and so real. There was a, a guy who came in, I still remember it, and I'll never forget it because it was a life-changing moment for me. He came in and he asked us as students, he couldn't see very well. He had cloudy vision and, and everywhere he looked, he just saw figures of things but had no clarity. He said, would you guys please pray for me that God would heal me? And I thought in my head, like, man, sure, we'll pray. You know, you're like, we'll see kind of what happens. And God at that moment, as about five or six of us gathered around him, restored his sight. It was a miracle. It was a miracle for him to see, but also it was a miracle for me because the eyes of my heart were opened up and becoming a follower of Jesus Christ became something that there was no other option but to do. I committed my life to proclaim the gospel and who he was everywhere I went from that moment. The question that I would have for you, and also John, who wrote the book of 1 John, would have for you, is have you had that moment? Have you had that moment where being a follower of Christ was so real and so authentic that you said, I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm willing to give up everything that I have to be able to, to, to know Christ and to make him known. Have you had that? The book of 1 John is all about that. When we look at this book and we look at this passage today, I believe this is the main thought. Knowing Jesus brings transformation. Knowing Jesus brings transformation. Do you know him? Is he so real within your life that he's changing you and you're changing people? Change lives, changing lives? Is that something that's happening within you? Now, John wanted that more than anything for those that he was writing to. Because there was people within the church that were beginning to dilute the gospel and they were beginning to say that Jesus was not God. There was a church split where they began to leave. You can see in the second chapter of 1 John. And they made John so mad that he called them children of the devil in chapter 3. Because what they were doing is they were, they were beginning to push this agenda or this idea where all of a sudden the gospel was not the gospel. 
but they began to change their views in such a way where it justified their immoral behaviors and it wasn't real. So as he was writing this book that you guys have been going through all summer, his push was this. He wanted believers to know and understand what it meant to have a real, authentic relationship with Christ, where you could really know Jesus and experience transformation. I believe that that's something that we want. And as we look at 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 21, there's some simple things that we can put in place within our lives so that we can know Christ and experience transformation. So how do we know him? Let's look at John, 1 John 5, verses 13 through 21 and read that. I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. And we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. And since he knows us, he hears us when we make our requests. And we also know that he will give us what we ask for. If you see a fellow believer sinning in a way that does not lead to death, you should pray. And God will give that person life. But there is a sin that leads to death, and I am not saying you should pray for those who commit it. All wicked actions are sin, but not every sin leads to death. We know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning, for God's Son holds them securely, and the evil one cannot touch them. We know that we are children of God and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come, and he has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And we now, and now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God and he is eternal life. Dear children, keep away from anything that might take place in your hearts. The first thing that I need to do in order to be able to know Christ, to be able to experience transformation within my life is this, is I need to engage with the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, as you look at John's writings, John wrote the Gospel of John, and he also wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Now, as we look at the Gospel of John, there's no greater gospel that emphasizes the work of the Holy Spirit. He wanted believers to know that in order to be able to know Christ, you need to engage in the work of the Spirit. You will see point after point, if you read the Gospel of John, where the Spirit of God is at work within people. John even goes on to say this, um, that the Spirit leads into all truth to communicate to believers then who are reading it and even to us today that the Spirit of God is going to be working in believers' lives to be able to, uh, for them to experience transformation. In the Gospel of John, it says, if you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. Who is that advocate? He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. So as Jesus left, what he was saying is, I'm going to be sending the Holy Spirit to you who will lead you into all truth. He will be an advocate for you. Now, who is the Holy Spirit? My dad always told me this story about when he was seven or eight years old and he was sitting in church and the pastor or whoever it was was up front and he was talking about the Holy Spirit. He would say, you know, the Holy Ghost is going to be coming upon you. He said, Andy, I was terrified, you know. He said, I'm sitting there thinking that there's this Holy Ghost that's out there that's going to come and get me. He said, I wanted to get out of church as fast as I could because I I didn't know what would happen. But who is the Holy Spirit? Now, John tells us the Holy Spirit is going to be coming. If we want to know Christ, we need to be able to engage the work of the Spirit in our lives. Um, The Bible Project is a great place for you to go to study God's Word. Um, on the Bible, in the Bible project, there's a video and it, it describes who the Holy Spirit is and the definition of the Hebrew word uh, that's used to identify him. For the Holy Spirit, this is what the Holy Spirit means, this word. It's an invisible, powerful energy and necessary for life. This is the simplest way to put it. The Holy Spirit is God's personal presence in our life. Isn't that pretty simple? 
So if we want to really know Christ, we need to know that uh, we need to be engaging within, with the, the Holy Spirit within our life. What is the Holy Spirit? It's God's personal presence within us. He's there. Now, the Holy Spirit, if you want to know how powerful the Holy Spirit is, and when you accept Christ, the Spirit of God is in you, he's transforming you, open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1 and begin to read. It should excite you when you see this. But, you know, before the world was created and everything that was here, in the first couple of verses there, it talks about how there was utter darkness, but the Spirit of God was there to empower creation. Isn't that amazing? That when you think about knowing Christ, that the Spirit of God, which is what? It's God's living presence that lives in us, is in us to be able to help push us to a place where we can know Christ. He's all-powerful. He created all things. And we as believers have the Spirit of God living in us. That should make all of us excited that the Spirit is there to be able to move and to change us. Holy Spirit, as you look throughout Scripture, what does he do? The Holy Spirit empowers people to discover and proclaim Christ. You know, you think about the Apostle Paul who wrote most of the New Testament. He had an encounter with God on the road to Damascus. But what happened? There was Ananias was, was prompted by the Spirit to come and share the gospel with Paul, which got him to a place where he accepted him. The Holy Spirit moved in Paul for him to be able to experience what he did, moved in another believer to come and share Christ with him so that all of a sudden, Paul would surrender his heart to Christ and be the hands and feet of Christ and have an impact that even lasts today. How did that happen? That happened through the power of the Spirit at work. That same power in Genesis chapter 1 that created all things is creating transformation in believers and empowering them to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and also to experience changes within them. Now, if we're really to know Christ and experience transformation, in 1 John, the, uh, John, as he did in the gospel of John, talks to us about what the Holy Spirit can do for us within our lives. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, it says, The Spirit resides in you and teaches you all things. As you're reading on your Plum Creek Bible app or wherever it may be, and you're starting to read and go through Scripture, and all of a sudden, maybe there's a new insight that has dropped into your heart or your mind. That's not by accident. That's the Spirit of God that's leading you and teaching you as you study Scripture and as you look at commentaries and, and as you're here every Sunday. The Spirit of God is teaching you things about Christ so that you can know Him more, so that you can experience transformation. John continues to say in 1 John chapter 3, verses 24, the Spirit helps us keep His commands. Man, when we look at all the commands and the things that, that, that God is, is saying, hey, follow me and do these things, sometimes um, we may think of those things like, man, there's no way that I could do this. There's no way that I could do that. There's, uh, there's just no chance. We need to know that the same God that created all things in Genesis chapter 1 is working within our lives and our hearts to be able to help us to follow the Lord's commands in all things. So it's not you that has to do all of that. But the all-powerful personal presence of God that we call the Holy Spirit is working in you to be able to help you to accomplish that. You know what I say to that? Whoo! Thank the Lord I don't have to do all that on my own. But it's God working in us. 1 John chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. I think Gary talked about this. The Spirit empowers us to love people. All of us probably have some people that are hard to love. Be, be honest. I mean, it's, it's true, right? People in our workplaces, people in our neighborhood. Maybe the one whose dog, they let their dog go and <clears throat> on your lawn all the time and it bothers you. You know, all, all of those things. The Holy Spirit empowers us to love people that are very difficult to love. As we engage in the work of the Spirit within our lives, great things can happen. We will know Christ better and be able to experience uh, transformation. Secondly, I view Jesus as God. If I really want to know Jesus, I need to view him as God. 
You know, we always, as people, view people in, in some sort of a way. We, we try to categorize people and identify them. You know, you could think back to high school. For some of us, that's longer than for others. But like there was always, like you would look at people and you tried to view them in a certain way and, and drop them into a certain group. You know, like there was the jocks. They would wear like those like Letterman jackets kind of things. Like some... Some of you, maybe not. I mean, is it something like that? Maybe I'm dating myself. You're like, gosh, you are old. That's so over. Like there was also like the National Honor Society when I was going to high school, they'd wear like those, these blue like sweaters with these stamps that said I'm smarter than all of you. You know, like <laughs> National Honor, like you view them, you, you see them and you have this view like, boy, they're geniuses. We also had the, the groupings of people that were like the dudes that would go off the property because they wanted to smoke, you know? And so they would smoke like really fast before the bell would ring so that like they could get into, I, I don't even know what they were called. You know, you also had the, you know, like the theater people. We always are trying to view people in certain ways. Now, in order for us to be able to know God to experience transformation, John defines for us what our view of God should be. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, this is a, this is a powerful declaration of who Jesus is. If you are a follower of Jesus and a true believer, John says, this is what your view of him needs to be. And we know that the Son of God has come and he has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? He is the only true God and he is eternal life. If we want to know Christ, our view of who Jesus needs to be shifted and changed, if it's not there yet, that he truly is God. We no longer are living in a Christian culture, but we are now living in a post-Christian culture. And because of that, what we're beginning to see more and more within research is that people are beginning to have different views of who God is. George Barna talks about this, that um, the younger generations are increasingly less likely to believe that Jesus is God. Four out of 10 adults believe that he was a religious leader, but not God. Millennials are the only generation among whom fewer than half believe that Jesus is God. People are conflicted now because of the shifting view of God on whether good deeds or a commitment to Jesus will get them to heaven. If you really want to know who God is, your view of him needs to be, of Jesus, your view of him needs to be that he's God. That he came down to this earth to save us. Because as our view of Christ, as our view of Christ is correct, what happens is it makes this love letter that has been given to us something that we should follow. If you simply believe that Jesus was a, a prophet or, or a man that walked the earth and helped people but was not truly God, you will never know him and you will never experience transformation. As you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and you see the stories of Jesus and how he transformed lives and what he did for you on the cross, that needs to move you to the place where you know that the God that created you sent his son down to earth to die for you so that you could have forgiveness of sins. Not only do we need to engage in the work of the spirit, but we also need to make sure that our view of who Jesus is is correct. Amen. Now, I, I would challenge you, as you enter into conversations with people, ask them, who do you think Jesus was? In your workplaces, in, in, in your neighborhoods, and wherever. Because the view is shifting. And for you to experience transformation with your life, it needs to be this. Jesus is God. He is my Savior, and I'm going to follow him with everything that I have. Lastly, as we look at this passage, not only do we need to engage in the work of the Spirit to know Christ and also have our view of Jesus be correct, that he is God, but we need to pursue the heart of Jesus. How do we do that? I was on a, a missions trip to Italy. Isn't that hard? <laughs> I ate pizza, you know, helped with kids, you know, sharing the gospel. I saw some beautiful things. It's so, it was, I was suffering for Jesus in Italy. 
there was uh, one guy in the, in the band, he told me, he's like, that's a real veteran move. You know, like, you're know, like, he, I, he I'll, I'll take the missions team to Italy. He's like, that, that's what you did. That was smart. I couldn't agree more. It was an awesome trip. But the, we were there. We were working. A great pastor there. It's a lost country that needs Jesus. But one of my favorite moments, when it talks about what does it mean to really pursue the heart of Jesus or the heart of anyone, was when at the end of each day, we would sit on the beach and we would begin to talk to each other. Now, so many times when you go to church, you meet people, you connect people, maybe you know, in, a, in a small group or wherever, you can connect in a deeper way. But when you get away with people, and they begin to share their hearts with you, all of a sudden you really begin to get to know them in a deeper way, in a special way. As they share their hearts and you share your hearts, there's all of a sudden, uh, uh, you're, you're together. You're in community. It's a beautiful thing. When we think about God, we need to know and understand that as we pursue his heart the way we do it, is the same way that we would with anybody who's sitting in this room that we connect with him, and that we talk with him in prayer. We serve a God that wants to have a relationship with us. Isn't that amazing? But so many times we overlook that. You know, there's ways for you to pursue the heart of, of God that, that happen here on a weekly basis. There's the prayer call that happens. When does that happen? Thursdays, Thursdays at 6.15 6, 6, 6, in the morning. If you're somebody that says, I really want to know God to be, to be able to experience transformation, get engaged in a, in, a, in a weekly prayer routine. Begin to pray and share your heart with him. Spend time with him. Paul Tripp says this, God is unwilling to be your means to what you call the good life. Your relationship with him must be your definition of the good life. When we're thinking about prayer, I think sometimes we have a, a misunderstanding of what it is. We think it's just where we request things to God, which is a big part of it. God wants to hear our needs, but also he wants us to share our hearts with him so he can share his heart with us so that what we pray all of a sudden becomes the will of God. Tim Keller, talking about prayer, says, prayer is the only entryway into genuine self-knowledge. It is also the main way we experience deep change the reordering of our loves. Prayer is how God gives us so many of the unimaginable things he has for us. Indeed, prayer makes it safe for God to give us many of the things we most desire. It is the way we know God, the way we finally treat God as God. Prayer is simply what? It's the key to everything. We need to do uh, everything we need to do and be in life. We must learn to pray. We have to pray. If we're really to know, to know God, we need to engage in the work of the Spirit. We need to make sure our, our view of Christ is right, but we need to pursue his heart. Look in John chapter 5, what he says to us. A true believer is pursuing Christ in prayer. He talks about this. He's, we're pursuing the heart of Jesus. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, it says, I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. And we are confident, that's big, we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. And since we know he hears us when we make our requests, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. If we're pursuing the heart of Christ, there are personal prayers and petitions and, and the personal aspect of sharing your heart with the God that created you. Are you doing that? If you want to know Christ and experience transformation and have something that is real when it comes to your faith, you need to be sharing your heart with Christ on a personal basis. He wants to hear your ups and downs and your fears and when you're joyful. Also, John says this, that as we're pursuing the heart of Christ, we need to not only be praying for our own hearts to be able to understand the heart of, of Jesus, but we need to be praying for others. Look at verse 16. If you see a fellow believer sinning in a way that does not lead to death, you should pray, and God will give that person life. If we're pursuing the heart of Christ, we want everyone to be living in the fullness of Jesus Christ. And so as we see people that are engaging in sin and seeing their lives destroyed because of it, we need to fall to our knees and begin to pray and say, God, save them. 
Because why do we do that? Because everything is so real and it's so authentic. And we know that there is no greater place to live than knowing Christ to be able to experience transformation because we're not living for the here and now, but we are living for eternity. And we, we care for a friend who's struggling. I was convicted myself thinking about that because there's people in my life that I need to be praying for more, that they'll get out of what they're involved in and continue to live in such a way that is honoring and pleasing to Christ. It's interesting, within the last verse of this book, John throws out another thing for everybody. What do we usually do? Hey, you know, peace out, see you later, you know, some texting thing, you know, at the end. John doesn't stop, but in verse 21, he also says this, that we need to pray that Jesus remains on the throne of our life. He knows that we live in a fallen world, and we need to pray and remember that Je- and pray and ask Jesus to be king of our life in all things. He says this, dear children, a last reminder, a last warning. He said, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Because he knew that that could happen. He knew that we could get off track living in a fallen world and that we needed to pray that through the empowerment of the spirit within our lives, that Jesus would remain in us, in Lord of our lives. Main thought, knowing Jesus brings transformation. How does that happen? I engage with the work of the Holy Spirit. I view Jesus as God, and I pursue the heart of Jesus. First John demands a response. I think... God wants to know. Do you want the real thing? Are you all in? There is no point of you coming here and just simply going through the motions. John would tell you that, which he has chapter after chapter as he's trying to get people to understand what it means to really be a follower of Christ. Because when we really know Christ, transformation occurs within our lives and it's a beautiful thing. As we close this morning, I'm gonna ask everybody to stand up. And by standing up, this is my prayer for you. That as you get up out of that chair and you stand up, you are declaring to the King of Kings, I want to know you and I want to experience transformation in my life. There's no greater place for you to invest in, in, than in eternity, than in your walk with Christ. And if you are at a place right now where you say, you know what? Jesus isn't on the, 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 the throne of my life. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. So I've been praying even this morning. I'm just praying that a breath of the Holy Spirit will fall on your lives and your hearts. And you could get back on track. Because this city has yet to see what this church can do for the kingdom of God. I believe that with all of my heart. And you know what this is every single week? This is like halftime. The game is when you're out there and you're connecting with people and proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. This moment is a moment to energize you, get you going, and to go back out of those doors and know Christ, experience transformation, and make him know. I want to pray for you. My prayer is this, that with all of your heart and with all of your mind, that you would say, God, I'm all in. I'm gonna engage with the work of your spirit in my life. I wanna be your hands and feet in the lives of people. There's nothing greater. That you're gonna say, I view Jesus as the son of God and I'm committed to following every commandment that he has given me because I wanna spend eternity with him. And lastly, 
start pursuing the heart of Christ like never before. It's there. Don't be fake. Don't lack authenticity. Nobody wants it. Let's pray. God is this wonderful, wonderful church is, is standing here today to proclaim to you that they are committed to knowing you by engaging with the work of your spirit in their life, by declaring that you are God and also by pursuing you with their hearts, pursuing your hearts with everything that they have. Lord, I pray through the power of your spirit that you would work in this place. Lord, that these wonderful, wonderful people here would be renewed, jump back on mission, do great things for you. Because Lord, I know that this, this valley has yet to see what this church can do for you. This church is the people who are sitting in here. God, I pray that their relationship with you would be so real. That as people see the transformation that's happening within their lives, that they could do nothing but stand back and say that you were wonderful and amazing. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give a huge thanks to Andy for being with us this weekend? All right, I have a favor to ask you before you go. Will you pray for us this week? Uh, on Tuesday morning, the Creek Student Ministry is sending 98 junior high and high school students to New Mexico for missions camp. Not only do they do summer camp, but during the day, they go out in the Santa Fe community for local missions work. So pray for safety, health, and for tremendous amounts of energy for those adults going. Uh, our prayer team will be down front if you need anything. The ushers are at the back door to receive your giving and next step cards. We hope you have a great rest of your weekend. We'll see you next week.